The, the next speaker is uh, Lex Ryder from ETH in Zurich. And the title of his talk is uh, Material Tailoring in the Extruder, Controlling Hydration and Rheology. Okay, Lex. Um, uh, thank, thank you to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to present results from my thesis. I hope that uh, you can see the, the video. So this is about, uh, my thesis revolved a lot about material tailoring in the extruder, which is essentially about um, controlling hydration and rheology. Uh, so what was shown already, sorry, okay. What was shown uh, already uh, before uh, was that for 3D printing, for the self-support, we have a certain minimum requirement on the yield stress, uh, which is to uh, be able to print the first layer. And at the very minimum, this yield stress has to evolve with the height of what we are printing. Um, and over longer periods of time or height, uh, also buckling can be important, and that will then scale uh, with the height exponent 3. Um, so we have a, a defined green zone in which our material should ideally be, um, and this is the yield stress evolution it should have over time. However, the next layer that we are placing should have a similar increase of yield stress over time. Um, and this can be a bit of a challenge to achieve such a characteristic uh, over a long period of time for the whole process. A very similar thing is also applied uh, in happening in slip forming, in which we are casting from the top uh, concrete at a constant rate, and we are moving up with the robot uh, to extrude it. Here, during the, uh, during the material uh, time period where it's staying in the formwork, uh, the yield stress should not evolve too much. But then again, we have a, a requirement of a linear yield stress increase over time. And we get a somewhat narrow uh, characteristic that we have to fulfill. And again, this is the case for every layer. And this is also true if we want to limit formwork pressure, for example, for casting processes, which could be very interesting for weak uh, formworks. Uh, and for, um, for spraying, we have very similar requirements too. So what is common here is that we have a self-recurring uh, process where for every layer we have the same uh, characteristic need. There has to be a material gradient inside so looking at this blue line, you can see that for every layer, we need a different yield stress. And we can define that uh, by a physical requirement. Now, for the layered extrusion process, we had set out to, um, to try to prefabricate components. And there, a, a big challenge is the short contour length. And that means that vertically, we have to build relatively fast the structure. Um, and from our robot setup, we also have the problem that we can only have a very light extruder. We also wanted to simplify our approach. So we wanted to get rid of the need for feedback control for the material placing. Um, and we didn't want any extruder rotations. So for that reason, we opted for this uh, uh, option on the, in the green. Uh, which means that in this sheared bulk approach, uh, we have to start with a much lower yield stress. And we, because of that, we have to rely much more strongly than other processes you see in the yellow on the increase of the yield stress over time. Um, and you can see here in this video that actually our process without any activation already um, collapses after about 10 centimeters. So we are very limited without this increase of yield stress over time. So obviously, we need to measure the yield stress evolution. Uh, the method that we use at ETH is uh, continuous uh, penetration, in which you see here on the left the uh, penetration tip that we insert into the sample at a constant rate over time. Uh, and we can measure the force. Then you get a graph, as you see here on the right. Uh, and this is a method that is relatively repeatable and gives for pace the exponential increase of yield stress you would expect uh, to have over time. Um, we have compared that to vein and uniaxial compression tests, and we see that this penetration force uh, scales linearly with these other methods from which we can calculate yield stresses. Then we have also looked uh, done um, uh, 
uh, soil mechanical model uh, that can directly and without any fitting relate what you have on the x-axis here, the yield stress from the slope penetration to the other methods. So uh, when, I, when I use um, yield stress evolution measurements, then this is coming from this penetration test. Um, back to the concepts. So here you see small amplitude oscillatory strain measurements uh, carried out on cement paste at, of different age. And you can see that on the sample that hydrates, the structuration rate uh, increases with the material age. Whereas even after 30 hours for, uh, for cement paste that are not hydrating because they are retarded with, uh, with sucrose, uh, we reach a plateau value. And these values that we get at the end of the uh, storage modulus measurement coincide very well with the rate of hydration at a given time. So we can create this master curve you see here on the left bottom, where we can directly relate uh, the structuration rate to a heat release. And we see that we get a very limited structuration rate if we have almost no hydration taking place. So this is mainly the flocculation process giving the yields to us. Then with hydration taking place, the literature would suggest that we have a strengthening of the um, flocculated network. And now importantly for the process, that means that the structuration rate, uh, in order to control that one, we have to actually control the hydration rate. And now for the processes, we have two options. We can either prepare all the time new material and in a way either hope that it hydrates fast enough once it reaches the nozzle or that we add an accelerator there. Or we can prepare uh, two materials um, independently where um, we are, which we call set on demand. And uh, we are using then an accelerator of which there are many options uh, to do the strength buildup. So this is what uh, these extruders look like uh, for slip forming, where we are bringing in from the bottom the concrete, we insert the accelerator, and then we let the material mix and flow down over shoot. We have the same for layered extrusion and for coating, uh, for coatings, and it's always the same concept. So it's a concrete that doesn't react very much. We um, combine it with an activator, we homogenize it in the mixing reactor, and then in the moment it flows out, uh, it starts hydrating and we get the strength buildup. And we want this travel time at the end to be relatively short, so these, ex uh, these mixing reactors are always on the extruder. So the industry is actually doing that exactly the same way. Here you can see a paper from Gosselin and co-authors where the red arrows are indicating the material stream. So there's a concrete and an accelerator. The patent of Lafarge shows exactly the same with two materials. The Zika process also has two components um, and you can see the extruder um, with the, uh, the pin mixers. And the Baumit setup is exactly the same again with two material streams, they mix it and then they place it immediately after. And our process is also just like that. The, you can see here the large arrow being the mortar going in, the small arrow being the accelerator. Inside, it looks like this. So we have a pin mixer inside and an auger. Uh, since uh, this uh, figure was made, the auger was removed, so we only have pins now. And the way this is working from a cement chemistry point of view is that what you see on the right is the OPC, so Portland cement hydration. Then we are adding to this a calcium aluminate cement um, and suspension. And what that causes is that on the left side of the graph, if you are familiar with ternary binder diagrams, we are going into the central zones. And in these central zones, uh, the, the hydration can become very fast. And what we are forming is a large quantity of ettringite. And this is observable, for example, in um, heat release measurements, as you can see here, where in the first hour after we add this accelerator, we have an, an increased heat rate. And this is called creating hydration products, which give us the strength increase. Um, however, not, not all accelerators are created equal. 
as shown in this example from uh, Anna Zabo's thesis, where uh, she was using an accelerator for slip forming. And in her case, it mattered a lot at which time the accelerator was added to the system. So you get very different characteristics of the strength increase, and that was too much to deal uh, with for her. So the picture you see on the right is the result uh, for the process that she got. Um, however, when she did a bit of tweaking and kept the strength build up more consistent, uh, the process was working very well for her. So we have to find out ways to either get robust uh, chemical systems or to deal with these variations. For the layered extrusion process, uh, we have now set out to create uh, hollow cylinders. And from the models that I showed before, we can now define a yield stress evolution over height or defined as over height. We have the material that is being accelerated and has this yield stress evolution over time. And we can change the rate of the strength buildup. Um, we can also measure how robust this um, acceleration is. So we can measure once before the experiment is started or before the printing is started, once afterwards and once on the second workday. And we get a very robust and reliable acceleration that doesn't change on a daily basis. So this is nice. Um, now we um, looked and tried to compare our measurements with what we managed to print. Um, so we measured the yield stress evolution, that's the uh, full line, and the dashed line is what we need from the process. And this would tell us that actually the printing should work. And the hollow uh, cylinder is also standing, but after some amount of time, the deformations are just too much, and we uh, get a very bad surface quality. Whereas by just slightly increasing the amount of strength buildup, uh, we get a perfect print. So the question now is, uh, what is going on here? And we can just say for now, that we can introduce a safety factor defining that we should limit the deformations. And we can try to quantify this by looking at uh, experiments in which we get immediate failure, in which we get the failure caused by the sagging of the element. Um, and we can also look at cases where there is no failure observed. And from that, we can derive a safety factor where we get uh, something around two. So what does this actually mean looking at other measurements? So we can, uh, as you know, we can calculate yield stress from different experimental methods. So here is an experiment from Vein, shear oscillation and uniaxial compression. And the yield stress would be taken here. But you can observe that there is already a lot of deformation and a very substantial decrease of the stiffness of the material happening before. So the value we should actually consider is at the end of the linear regime. And this is about here. And that is gi give or take more or less in the range of one third or half of the um, actual yield stress. So this um, safety factor that we defined seems to be accounting for this difference uh, between the um, between the case where it just about stands and where we keep the deformation small enough so that we can print continuously. And when all of that comes nicely together, what we can print uh, is uh, these kinds of structures. So we printed in, with the student project 12 columns of three meters high at in about uh, two hours each without any interruptions. And you can see here from the print quality that this also works relatively robustly and different columns also have relatively similar uh, print quality. So this is exhibited in Riom in the Swiss mountains. To conclude, um, for component level printing, um, I want to make you aware that the uh, structuration rate is important because we want to build relatively fast. Um, and, and don't want to interrupt the printing. Um, for, in order to do this, we want to have hydration control. 
And one way of doing that is with set on demand processing uh, that you can see here, the three approaches and the prototypes we uh, uh, manufactured uh, with the colleagues that you see on the bottom. And with that, um, I want to thank the Swiss National Science Foundation and the NCCI Digital Fabrication for funding and Anna Anton from uh, the printing project uh, for the help with the measurements. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Very interesting uh, uh, talk. Uh, we have some questions now. Did you consider viscoelastic, viscoplastic deformations? Uh, these can explain your needed factor or safety for the, uh, the factor of safety uh, for the hollow cylinder. Uh, yeah, that is, that is in a way essentially what we are doing. Uh, we are looking at, we are looking at the discrepancy between the linear regime and the, the yield stress and it's largely creep or viscoelastic behavior. Yeah. But it's, it's not done in a very, uh, consequential way so far. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, the next question. For, what's the maximum aggregate content in the mixture allowed in the penetration resistance test? For the layer extrusion, did you measure the interlayer bonding of the printed sample? Because uh, the material with a fast structure, structuration uh, rate may result in the cold joint, especially when you upscale the printing object. So, um, one one question at a time. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, uh, I'll break it down, sorry. Uh, the maximum aggregate content um, for the penetration test is defined by uh, the closed packing. So you, you should be somewhere in a regime where you are, um, where you have um, enough matrix so that you could make an SCC out of it. So you cannot do that for normal concrete, but it depends on the particle uh, size distribution, so I, I can't give a, a direct answer to that. Did you, uh, okay, about the uh, inner layer, did you measure the interlayer bonding of the printed sample? Yeah, our process is uh, infinitely uh, uh, evolving. The process that we had uh, about two years ago had basically no uh, difference between the interlayer and the material itself. So we tested in different orientation. The paper is also now public, so I can I give you that reference. Um, however, that is not always true for everything that we do. Um, in general, we are having better experience with the layer interlayer bonding when we have short times between layers. Um, and uh, if we have a low yield stress in general at the time of placing. Uh, actually, I like the idea of you have to look at the yield stress at a uh, small strain, obviously. If you've strained the system a bit, it's kind of pointless if you're <laughs> trying to get a, you know, a system that's not going to you know, change very much as you're printing it. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, the stress uh, for the yield stress, though, did you also consider like a Bingham yield stress as well? Or are you pretty much sticking to the stress growth for the, uh, the correlation? Um. Well, we could use the, uh, the models of uh, Roussel and Perrault, um, but the initial yield stress over the longer time periods is uh, so small compared to what happens afterwards in these ac accelerated systems that I usually just take a linear fit for the mm -hmm. initial part. Uh, but one can do this obviously also uh, properly and nicely. Um, and then also take into account uh, the initial yield stress, yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, th uh, let's see, I have another question here. Did you yeah. use any supplementary cementitious materials? Yeah, so there is now a paper submitted that hopefully comes out soon, uh, where we have done uh, substitutions of 50% of OPC and uh, we are down to a bit over 300 kilograms of Portland cement uh, by cubic meter, if that is what uh, you are asking about. So we have, we have done about 50% substitution and it was printing good enough for, uh, for our process. Okay. 
All right, well, one more question, and then we'll uh, proceed to the next speaker. Uh, can you comment on the role of stiffness and its decrease on controlling the deformations before yield stress is reached? Yeah, but, um, that that goes a bit into the questions that were um, that were that the question that was asked before. Um, if we look at, for example, here at the vein, uh, you can observe the the linear part at the beginning and from that point on you have on the x-axis a, a deformation that is viscoelastic um, or creep or whatever um, and uh, that deformation is something uh, that the, that would also result on the print so that would be associated with this sagging but i haven't done any uh, calculation from the characterization tests over to uh, the uh, the print. Uh, the way that we are dealing with it is that we just increase the accelerator dosage until it works in a stupid and simple way. Oh, okay, yeah. that's a very good, uh, very nice talk. 